Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the piano stage curated by the line of Best Fit. We have lots of secret sessions here, but right now we're doing a very special Q&A with Everton fan, <laughs> holder of babies, and lead singer of Future Islands, Samuel T. Herring. Hello. How are y'all doing? I'm just recently, just, uh, just within a few seconds ago, I was a holder of babies. <laughs> ba baby. You can add that to your bio. Yeah. I was like, have I held a baby before? Oh, you're asking the question. Oh, no, I don't I'm have sorry. you held a baby before. <laughs> that's, that's your job. Well, we'll have like a little chat and then we'll open it up to everyone here who's desperate to ask some questions. Get your journalist hats on because I think I left mine back in my tent this morning. Um, how are you doing? What have you been up to? I'm doing good. Um, I'm out with the band. We've been on the road for just uh, about a week and a half now. Um, um, well, coming up on two weeks. And uh, yeah, last tour of the year, last tour of uh, an album cycle. I don't know if you guys know about this thing that we do as musicians. <laughs> we put out records and then we, we uh, play as many shows as we can before people get tired and they want more songs. So we may be past the mark, but, uh, but we have more songs coming out, so that's good. You have been releasing some new singles, so what are you working on at the moment? Uh, well, we, we, we have a record wrapped and we're just figuring out how, to, how and when to put it out, but it, it will be soon. That's an exclusive. Don't. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's ex, it's always exciting. It's funny though when you know. I think for us when we write a record, you're talking about the last like from this point in my life. It's the last three years, and then you wait another six months or another year to put it out. And so it's always a funny thing. I think I talk to a lot of musicians about this because by the time you're actually touring an album, you're kind of going through old emotions and old feelings, and you're still kind of discovering what those feelings really meant as well as changing your feelings. <laughs> and sometimes you're like, I don't really feel that way anymore. And it can be, it can be a little awkward in playing songs. Sometimes you, you uh, have to just re, reconsider the idea, reconsider the emotion. And, uh, and, and actually for me, like, it's about performing the songs, performing the lyrics as they mean to me in this moment on stage. You know, we have songs, we have a song that we love to end our sets with that's, uh, 16 years old now and the way that that song has traveled through my life in itself says so much about my own life like I can track that song and how it felt at the different times and what that person that that song is about has meant to me over those times but it says so much about my own maturity and growth as a human um, and just what that song means to me so so it's it's interesting how these things are already have an inbuilt uh, intimacy within the artist, um, but then how they grow, I don't know. It can actually be really frustrating sometimes because you you realize things about yourself later or things about life uh, that you just didn't realize when you were a child writing a song, um, when you thought you knew everything and that everything was gonna be the same forever and wonderful, and then uh, and then you have to actually face face the truth. I mean, I suppose a lot of people first discovered you when you did that performance on, was it Letterman? Letterman, yeah. Which was your 4AD debut, but you guys were releasing records for years before that on, on the UK label called Upset the Rhythm. Yes, yeah, our first, uh, our, actually our first uh, album um, was released uh, by a London outfit called Upset the Rhythm, who put on our first shows over here and were amazing to us. Our good friends Chris and Claire ran this label. They still, they still run the label. They do a lot of, uh, if you ever see you know, the uh, schedules for Upset the Rhythm shows you have to go because they're always putting on cutting edge artists um, from all over the UK, Ireland, Europe, and the States, um, from wherever. They just, they do amazing work. Um, and they really kind of saved us because we were trying to find somebody to put out our first album. Nobody wanted it. And, uh, and our buddy Dan Deacon, um, who's a really good friend, another amazing artist, uh, who had been working with Upset the Rhythm, doing shows here for years, gave our CDR of our album to Chris and Claire and they they said they wanted to put it out. And it, but the funny thing was is that album did nothing for us in the United States because you couldn't get it here. It was like, do you want to buy our $50 CD <laughs> like <laughs> import? But when we got here, when we got to uh, to England and to Europe, people actually knew our music. Um, you know, this is we first came over here in February of 2009. Um, and uh, and that was a really a f like affirming situation for the band because you know you are you are going after this thing that's a dream and everything is telling you to stop and everything is telling you to give up and it's always those like 
little successes when you're following a dream, not just within music, but with whatever, whatever it is in your life or within your family, you know, within your work. It's those, those if, you can, if you can just feast on those morsels of, of, of joy um, that, that, uh, that you can get, it can really sustain you to get to the next one. But you really have to take it as it is, you know, and take those little moments. You don't really realize it in, the, in, this, in those moments, but you can't have it all at once, you know. Um, I think part of being an artist is wanting, <laughs> is wanting it all, is, to, is because there's a hole, you know. I think there is, the artist feels incomplete and part of the art, the art and the output and that connection with an audience or just the connection with the self is about, is about f uh, fulfilling something that's lost. But it's, but it's a constant, it's a, it's a, it is a constant struggle. So, so I think it, it is important within life to, to take those moments and, and enjoy them and, uh, and allow it to, to take you forward. Does that connection with the audience change if you're playing a basement in East London versus headlining the wood stage at End of the Road? Uh, yeah, but you know, it's, it, it, well, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, the, 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 the format changed. Like if I was to go back and play the basement, which I've played so many basements, uh, it would feel very different now. But I played some basements back in the day, like 2006 and seven and eight. I played some of the coolest basements in the United States. Um, and that, and th those were like the great joys of our life, you know, and you sleep where you play, you know, sleeping on a beer stained carpet, like <laughs> on, the, on the same, the same, in front of the same drum kit that you, you sang in front of, you're sleeping there later. Because that, that's also a, that's, that's its own sense of community. I think as things get bigger, you, uh, I always talk, I always say that, uh, playing shows is, is more like, uh, there, there's an aspect to it that is the way they, when you talk about sports, it's like golf is not against another player. It's kind of against the self and against this course. You know, every stage is different. Every audience is different. You're in a different um, city or state or county or country, and the culture is different. Like you play all these different elements, you, you have to learn. Um, so, so I think there's always there's a constant growth and growing um, into a thing. You know, so I couldn't have played. I couldn't have played the stages before I played the uh, before I played the living room, you know, and I couldn't have played the festival before I understood what the stage was. I mean, I could have, but but that that slow that's I think for us we we actually had a very natural growth. Sorry, I talk a lot. I really go on. Uh, yeah. but, but the fact is, is a lot of people found out about us because of a late night television performance. In the States, it was uh, Letterman um, in March of uh, 2014. Um, and here it was Jules Holland, which was later that year, uh, which, was, which was really, uh, really changed our fortunes here in, uh, in England as well as over, over in Europe. But, um, but the thing is, is people <laughs> didn't know that we'd been doing this for, uh, eight years at that point, and we had three albums out already with a new one coming, and we'd, we were up, we were almost 800 shows in. So a lot of people thought like, oh, this band just came out of nowhere, and they didn't realize that it was very polished. You know, polished for what it was. You know, we were at a galvanized moment of the band where we knew exactly who we were. We knew what we were trying to do. We felt like we were making the best music uh, that we had made at that point. So in a way, it was really, we were given, we were given an opportunity at a time. We earned an opportunity, but also we're given an opportunity to uh, to showcase what we did, and we, we we took it. You know, we were supposed to be on Letterman three years before that, um, and it with our previous record, it just didn't happen. And I always think that if that had happened, we wouldn't have been the same band. You know, and uh, we we just we wouldn't have been as polished. It still would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this isn't yeah, your definitely. first time playing End of the Road either, so... No, yeah, this is our second time. What have you learned about the festival from your previous experience? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Well, I was just saying, the last time I was here, the last memory I have was I was in the woods somewhere <laughs> late, at, late in the night with a bunch of other people dancing on tables. <laughs> there was loud music. I have probably had three beers in my three hands. Uh, I'm just like, I was having the best time. And I remember running across the field because I had to catch the sprinter out. But, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, the f festival world has changed so much for us. Like, it's definitely become something we're more comfortable with, more comfortable with the big stage. And, uh, 
And uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm ex- I was excited to come back here because I know just from looking at the lineup that this isn't a, just a regular music festival. This is something that's really carefully curated um, and, and like trying to expose people to really interesting music and things that they wouldn't have heard. Because I, I, don't, I, I don't recognize a lot of things and that's very exciting, I think. Well, I think everyone here is excited to have you. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> and now we've established that you're a very friendly guy. You are a chatterbox. <laughs> There's nothing to be afraid of. Does anyone have any questions for Sam? Okay, this man with the child's hand shot up straight away. <sighs> well, I mean, so when we were when we were making our first 4AD album singles in 2013, uh, we were recording at a studio in upstate New York. It was the first time we were ever recording an album in a studio, um, and I was taking advantage of all the free things that were there because I didn't have anything. They had satellite TV, and I was watching. Uh, there was a channel that was playing classic uh, Premier League matches, classic La Liga matches. Uh, classic Champions League, and I just started watching um, games again. I grew up playing football, um, state champion, under 12s, yeah. team captain. I was the PK man. <laughs> yes, yeah, but but I grew up playing. I loved it, but I but I just fallen away from it. I, I love sports. I grew up uh, as in as playing sports until I discovered weed. Um, all the children here are babies, right? They don't understand what I'm saying. And then I discovered weed. It's hard to catch a baseball. <laughs> You're really stoned, and I decided that was more fun, um, and got into music. But but that's a thing that really uh, that I've always have found joy in. Um, uh, like I don't know, there is something I, I love to share emotion on stage. I love to share that through my work, and <laughs> I don't want to make that. Well, I just believe there is something about watching these grown men fighting over a ball that are just bawling <laughs> at that that level of emotion in this masculine, the masculine. The masculinity breakdown, which I think is important within our society, is to not is to not think that we have to be like strong, but we can we can actually are stronger if we're sharing our emotions. So so there is a thing about <laughs> that tough guy in the pub who's just gonna break down if his team doesn't win, or he's gonna break down if his team does win, <laughs> and he's allowed to show his emotions. But I think it's important that we show those emotions all the time. But I became an Everton fan because. I wanted to follow, when I, we got done recording that record, I didn't have a TV. I think I'd just gotten a laptop at this point, 20, end of 2013. I wanted to watch games, but I needed a team. Didn't want to follow a, a really good team. Didn't want to follow a really bad team. So I looked at the Premier League table, looked at the ninth, 10th, and 11th place teams. I watched them all play a game. It was West Brom, Aston Villa, and Everton. And Everton was my team. And that's how I became a fan, so 10 years on. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone could have else been worse. got a question? Maybe a non-sport question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know you're from Baltimore, as I am I, and I'm just wondering. What's up? Yay! Come on. Um, <laughs> how would you describe Baltimore, and why? Why? What makes you stay there, basically? Uh, I've been there for 15 years now, um, and I spend. I actually probably spend less and less time there these days. I'm constantly on the move, um, and there's something about being a musician where you you do kind of break through this wall of what is home and home kind of can feel like anywhere. Like I feel really, I actually feel really at home in a hotel room when I just have my suitcase. You know, there's less, there's less of all my things. I think sometimes I'm around all my things and I get, I want to be there. I'm like, I want to touch my record collection. I want to listen to records, but then I get there and it's so overwhelming that I can't even listen to a record. Um, but, but we came to Baltimore because of the, the community really and the music community which is really beautiful. Baltimore is a city, there's, there are cities similar to Baltimore, but it really is, has its own special <laughs> thing about it. Um, and I think it's a city that is very beaten down. And at the same time, the people there are really joyful, or at least like they, they will give you a lot of heart if you show them heart back. And I think that's something that really speaks to me. Um, you know, we come from small towns in the South, uh, in North Carolina, which is where the band is, is originally from. Even though, I mean, for the first year and a half of the band. But Baltimore has always been, uh, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things you kind of choose, you choose those places and then they just kind of grow on you and it's hard to leave, you know. That's where, that's where the families are, that's where the friends are, you know, and that's, that's, uh, that's kind of where you find yourself. But I'm constantly, 
I kind of, all my things live there and I, <laughs> I'm like a satellite around that room. You know, I still live in a shared house in Baltimore. <laughs> like, uh, I'm still like in an old punk house, um, a grown up punk house. So it's kind of, it is kind of funny. I can't move out. It's 300 bucks a month. I can't move my stuff out. So I just, I just live. I just live really free and, and, uh, and, I, and I choose to because it's hard. I feel like if I moved out of Baltimore, I would lose a piece of, of myself. So it's really hard to get out. It, it is, it's insidious. Um, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Baltimore is really special to our heart. And it's kind of, it kind of gave us the strength to go forward. We came out of North Carolina, which is very much more, well, we were coming up country and rock. And we were like three guys with, or originally four guys, this is our band before Future Islands, with uh, you know keyboards and a bass guitar. We didn't use guitars, and people just thought we were clowns. You know, they, they didn't understand what we were doing. They thought it was childish. And then we moved to Baltimore in a scene that was really uh, colorful and eclectic and uh, noisy and, and fun. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, we went from being these clowns in our own scene to being these serious. <laughs> we, actually got, we actually got caught that in our first write-up in Baltimore. It was like the serious guys in a class full of class clowns. Um, and, and it wasn't until we kind of we said, we're moving away. We're going to make our own way. And then we would come back to North Carolina. And then it was like, ah, oh, the prodigal son's return. And kind of finally got the appreciation and love that, that we, had, we had hoped for in the first place. But Baltimore gave us the heart. And, and I often say that if there's musicians out here um, who are starting out, you know, it's really important that you kind of get the strength for your band, your launching off point, point coming from your community. You know, you don't have to go, you don't have to go two, three, four hours away to create that base. Like it all kinds of starts at home, you know, um, whether that's within your family or your friends or your, your larger group of friends. But those people really become the base that that kind of give you the hope and the and the power to go out and then conquer. You know, I always say, you know, you don't have to you don't have to tour like this. You know, you kinda you kinda do the reverse snail shell and you you can just kind of keep keep growing and feel allow yourself to feel comfortable as you as you go outside of your comfort zone. Um, but moving to Baltimore was outside of our comfort zone and it really did it pushed us and made us work really hard um, to make it work. Yeah, it deserves a round of applause. Great Man, advice. I talk. Great advice. Does anyone What's else up? have a question for Sam? What's your favorite song that you've ever played? The hard hitting questions. Man, that's a good question. I think there's always, uh, it's always the newest one. We've been playing a song called Deep in the Night. We just put out a couple of weeks ago. And, and that's, that's been a really fun one to sing just because it, it is delving into uh, emotions that I haven't really uh, <laughs> gotten to fully uh, exercise or go through on stage. For me, something about it is uh, very therapeutic. Not, I know it's cliche to say, but it's true. Like there's a, ther there's a therapy in the writing and even more so it's the exercising of, of uh, those emotions in front of an audience. It's kind of like we can say what's messed up about ourselves <laughs> to ourselves and we're like, I got it under control. But then you yell that to a thousand people and you really have to, you really see how it bounces back and you see how it feels. Um, you see how it feels to say it and then you feel it even deeper. Um, so it's always the newest song, but like performing songs uh, for our, our mainstay set, long, there, we have an old song called Long Flight that I love to play. Um, I do a big seal slide. That's what we, that's what we call it. I always it's my favorite part of the show. I get to see how far I get to like slide on my belly across the stage, <laughs> and I can go pretty far. <laughs> but it is <laughs> it's like I said, like a golf course though. You know, I have to I have to like like test it, see how slippery it is. You got to make sure you get a good launch point. How many feet is it gonna take? To get it? <laughs> but it's all it's all a bit of fun. Um, so yeah, and Little Dreamer, as I said before, is a song that I love to play because I get to kind of, uh, I get to talk about it before the, before the song. And, and in talking about that song, it's really about talking about the history of the band. Because it, it is the history of the band, as I was saying, you know, um, and how, how we've grown and how we've changed. This stage usually makes someone play a cover. If you have to pick a song to cover right now, what would it be, and what's your connection to that song? 
Uh, hmm. You know, the first song that came to mind was, uh, what's the name of it? I, th- I want to say it's My Head Is My Only House Unless It Rains, the Captain Beefheart song. Do you know it? Um, that is one of my favorite songs. Uh, period, hands down. It's just a beautiful song, and I think, I think I've probably lifted like uh, <laughs> three or four lines off it. <laughs> you know, it's it's one of those not on not on purpose, not on purpose. But you you listen back, and then you're like, ah, yeah, that line is perfect, and that's kind of like my line. Um, but yeah, yeah, that I think that album found me at a time. Uh, it's on Clear Spot. It found me at a time that I really needed it. Um, and it showed that hurly burly voice in a in a softer light, you know, um, and away from the kind of the the harder and the more out there stuff. It was just like a beautiful song, which I think is is uh, I think it's just nice nice to see a different side of an artist who I think we only see the the hard edges of, or we think the hard edges are. Um, what does he say? Uh, my feet are too far to walk from you. If my if my feet don't work, I'll I'll use a train or a bus just to find you. Um, uh, if I can just feel your arms, if I can. Oh man, I'm gonna mess this up. I I'm so the, sorry, I cannot help. You don't know the Does song. Does anyone know this? I don't know this song. Does anybody Does know the song? Does anyone know the lyrics? Has anyone got service? Nah, it's it's the lines, man. Oh yeah, no, nobody has service out here. No, we can't Google it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, my head is my only house unless it rains. Um, that would be it. I think we've got time for one more question. So if anyone's like... I... Which band stroke bands influenced you as a teen and as an adult? Well, so I, I really grew up on hip hop. I, I came up um, I came up as a huge hip hop fan. Um, and and that was my original art form. Um, that's how I came to writing. That's how I came to poetry. Um, and then when I got to college was when I, I found I'd never heard Joy Division. I'd never heard The Cure. Um, and so so those bands really, like Joy Division, The Cure, uh, later on OMD, uh, which are, are huge influences on on Future Islands. Um, but uh, when I was a kid, as I said, I was a hip hop head. But I loved Primus. <laughs> And I loved I loved Danzig, which makes a lot of sense. Danzig and Elton John, um, which were my from my brother and then from my mother. And one of my favorite all time bands was Morphine. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, um, which were really cool because they were. It was a guy who played a two string slide bass, and he has like one of the deepest voices. Uh, morphine, ooh, two string, two st- <laughs> two string slide bass, saxophone, and drums. Like that's the instrumentation. Um, and just just a very interesting band. And they went from being kind of like blues rocky, which I wasn't really into, but then also very experimental. And then also just like gorgeous, gorgeous, sad songs um, that really hit me. Like there's a song called In Spite of Me that's really worth finding. Um, I know you did it all in spite of me. Uh, ooh, it's going to give me chills. But, but yeah, yeah, those are some of the bands. You do. You do need to write it down. <laughs> Can, can we give this gentleman a question? I s- saw him hiding. What is the funniest or strangest thing that's ever happened to you on tour? Oh, man. I'm so bad at these questions. Uh, hey, B- hey, where's Ben at? Ben, do you got any? <laughs> My manager's here somewhere. What's, what is it? <laughs> now I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I wish that was our first question so I could have thought about it. Huh. Well, last time you played here, didn't you get given quite a unique gift? What was that? Oh, what was that? It's like a personalized operation. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think I forgot about that. What happened to that? <laughs> I think you got given a personalized somebody operation made the opera- game. <laughs> yeah, somebody made an operation game, but it had my face on it, <laughs> which is just weird. <laughs> uh... Man, there's so many weird things. You know, you, you, you <laughs> in the early days, there's a whole lot of things that I forgot about because you're just too, too drunk to remember. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have a good answer for you. It is, it is hard. Also, tour sometimes really isn't as exciting as people think. Tour is not as exciting as you think. Um, it, and, you know, it's hard. It's hard work. 
And just uh, so much of the work of tour is just like the mental fortitude to make it to the end. Um, and that all the things you miss, um, the comforts of home, um, and the ability to just kind of uh, sleep anywhere, eat anything, um, and survive on the kindness of strangers um, is so much of it. And that goes a long way. Um, so let a band sleep on your floor, please. You're doing a great service. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, luckily for you, you are at the end. You're yeah. at the end of the road. Yeah. <laughs> Headlining tonight on the wood stage at 9.30, Future Islands. Please Come give it up hey. for Sam. Come say hey. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. 